As a United Methodist Church, being methodical is literally our middle name. The term originated as an insult hurled toward a small group of Christians founded by Charles Wesley and three others when they were students in Oxford, England in 1729. That group was called the Holy Club, and by the time John Wesley joined the group, the club gained a, a reputation for their rigorous and rigid observance of spiritual practices. They observed communion, translated New Testament Greek, visited the sick and imprisoned, and prayed with great regularity. At first, they met only twice a week, and then it turned into every day, every evening from 6 to 9 p.m. Outsiders mocked them for being methodical, and John Wesley took it as an insult. He thought that being called Methodist meant being associated with the Roman Emperor Nero, whose attending physician prescribed a rigid, inflexible regimen of diet and exercise, and Wesley didn't want any label that would be associated with such a pagan tyrant. And that wasn't the only nickname the club was getting thrown at it. Others were calling this pious group of college students the super arrogation men, the godly men, the sacramentarians, the enthusiasts, and my favorite, the Bible moths. That's right, as in the blind bugs that fly into light bulbs. Our church could have been named the Hyde Park Bible Moth Church. But it was Charles Wesley, the founder of that club, who talked his brother down from his frustration and convinced him, ultimately, that the term Methodist was not such a bad label after all. And maybe they could redeem it and turn it into something positive. To be a Methodist meant to take the practices of the Christian faith seriously, to be diligent in worship, in small groups, in serving others, in financial giving, in reading scripture, in invitation, and in prayer. The same seven spiritual practices, by the way, that we claim in our discipleship pathway. On this second Sunday of our worship series, The Meaning of Methodist, we remember that a united Methodist is one who practices the faith daily. It's a sentiment echoed by the psalmist in today's scripture reading. Psalm 119 is filled with the passion and devotion of a person who took seriously the spiritual practice of reading and applying the scriptures. He said, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day long. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. I do not turn away from your ordinances, for you have taught me. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. And it includes verse 100. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. The psalmist describes a life that is methodical, intentional, and regular in reading the scriptures and keeping the commandments and performing the practices that God requires of him. In other words, the psalmist was acting like a Methodist. But here's an important reminder for John and Charles Wesley and the early founders of Methodism. The point of keeping all these spiritual practices was not just for the sake of ticking off a checklist and filling your time with pious good deeds. Spiritual practices are not the ends in and of themselves. In fact, during the time of the Holy Club, they were by far not the only group that emphasized keeping spiritual disciplines, but there were two distinguishing features of early Methodism. One was its attentiveness to the sick and the poor, and the other was the notion that these outward and visible practices were only effective if they transformed your inward self. It wasn't enough just to methodically check off your spiritual practice boxes for the day. They had to lead you to an inward place of love for God and love for all people. Outward practices should lead to inward holiness. John Wesley was often guided by these words by the great theologian Thomas Akempis. He said, I take religion to be not 
the bare saying over so many prayers, morning and evening, public and private, not anything superimposed, added now and then to a careless worldly life, but a constant ruling habit of the soul, a renewal of our minds in the image of God, a recovery of the divine likeness, a still increasing conformity of heart and life to the pattern of our most holy redeemer. This is what led John and Charles Wesley to be so zealous about their spiritual practices, and this is what ultimately led them to embrace the pejorative Methodist label, because they knew that practices were only a means to an end, which was, in John's terms, having, quote, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. And ironically, it's a concept that John Wesley would very nearly forget and it almost led him to walk away from the church just 10 years after joining that Oxford Holy Club. In 1735, shortly after the death of their father Samuel, John and Charles left for a mission trip to America where they would spend two years and four months preaching the gospel to the early residents and settlers in what is now our state of Georgia. It was an eventful 28 months for all the wrong reasons. On the outbound ship on the Atlantic, a vicious storm nearly broke the boat apart, terrifying John Wesley, and he realized how fearful he was of death. In contrast to the peace and calm of some Moravian Christians on board who seemed to have a stronger faith than he did. The time in Georgia came and went with very little evidence of success. By the end of his time there, John Wesley headed back to England demoralized and in disbelief. Literally, he found himself on the verge of profound doubt in himself and in his faith in God. On January 24th, 1738, on the ship back to England, Wesley wrote this in his journal. I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? Who, what is he that will deliver me from this evil heart of unbelief? I have a fair summer religion. I can talk well, nay, and believe myself while no danger is near, but let death look me in the face and my spirit is troubled. Nor can I say to die is gain. That same month in his journal, Wesley wrote these words. By the most infallible of proofs and inward feeling, I am convinced, one, of unbelief, having no such faith in Christ, as will prevent my heart from being troubled, which it could not be if I believed in God and rightly believed also in him. It's a long, raw, and revealing journal entry. Not even the great John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement, was immune from periods of doubt and struggles in his faith. Even he had stretches where his faith felt weak, despite the fact that he approached the faith with such intentionality and devotion and commitment in his practices. In other words, you and I can relate to moments like what he went through. Which brings us to a grand moment of revelation for Wesley and the real value of what it means to be methodical in our faith and to be diligent in our practices. Because just a few weeks after Wesley returned to England and wrote those words in his journal, he met a man named Peter Bowler. Wesley would later say that meeting Bowler would be, quote, a day much to be remembered because meeting him would change Wesley's life. Bowler was a German bishop in the Moravian church of the same Moravians who impressed Wesley with their faithful calm amid the storm. Wesley confessed to Peter Bowler how much he was struggling with his faith and his doubts. He was set to preach the next day and he told Peter Bowler that he was, quote, clearly convinced of unbelief and he was tempted to not preach the next day and he wondered in his journal how he could, quote, preach to others when he had not faith himself. He asked Bowler whether he should not preach, and Bowler said he should. And Wesley asked him, but what can I preach? And Bowler replied, preach faith 
till you have it. And then because you have it, you will preach faith. To put it in layman's terms, practice the faith until you have it. And then because you have it, you will practice faith. That nugget of insight reminded Wesley of the real importance of spiritual practices and good deeds. We don't do spiritual practices in order to be saved. We do spiritual practices because we are saved by faith. And then we do spiritual practices to be strengthened in our faith. So if you're in a place in your life where you feel like your faith is weak or you are unsteadied by doubts or disbelief, then practice the faith until your faith is strong. And then you can practice the faith because your faith is strong. That insight would give John Wesley the courage and strength to go one day at a time, one faithful step, one spiritual practice at a time, until two months later, on May 24th, 1738, John Wesley walked into an evening meeting of Christians on Aldersgate Street in London, and there, after hearing a sermon based on Martin Luther's preface to the Book of Romans, a wave of clarity would settle into his spirit and his doubts would dissipate, and he would experience the most famous moment when his heart was strangely warmed. All because he did not give up when he felt his doubt. He continued to practice the faith until he had a strong faith. Years later, Wesley would read the same words of our scripture reading today from Psalm 119, 97 to 112. And when he got to the words of verse 100, I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts, he would write this sentence as commentary. The practice of religion is the best way to understand it. The practice of religion is the best way to understand it. Friends, in this church, when we talk about spiritual practices, the discipleship pathway of worship, small group service, financial generosity, reading scripture, invitation, and prayer, we don't do these things simply because it's some checklist for self-congratulatory holiness. We encourage you to follow these practices because we all have moments when our faith needs to be strengthened. And some of you may be going through such a stretch right now. So to be Methodist in the most basic sense of the word means to keep practicing until your faith is strong so that you can practice your faith because it is strong. You can scan the QR code right there on your screen or go to hydeparkumc.org slash next steps to learn more about these practices, including signing up to be part of a small group and stick around until the end of today's online service for a video that celebrates the impact that small groups have made on people in this church. Let's each take the next step in our walk with Jesus because in the words of John Wesley in Psalm 119, 100, the practice of religion is the best way to understand it. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for meeting us in our innermost struggles and doubts. Thank you for the gift of agency and action that allows us to practice the faith even when we waver. Give us the discipline and the commitment to be faithful in worship, small groups, service, generosity, scripture reading, invitation, and prayer that we might practice and ultimately understand the depths of your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.